how did I handle working full time as a physician? I just try to be very honest with myself about the actual time that I could dedicate to it. So the low hanging fruit was a new construction home where the math made sense that was going to be low maintenance and things were still going to happen, but at least. Did you buy a rental property first or a primary residence first? Well, that's what we're going to be jumping into today with Cassandra, who is one of our Inner Circle members with Lady Landlord, and we're going to be talking about her journey with her real estate investments. So Cassandra, welcome. How are you doing today? Oh, so great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Of course. I've loved watching what you've been able to do with your portfolio over the past year now. And I appreciate you coming on. I know this will help other women that are going through certain situations be able to say, okay, I can now do that too. So can you just tell us a little bit about who you are behind the real estate investing space? Sure. So my name is Cassandra. I live in Florida and I'm a full-time practicing physician. I am married. My husband and I have actually known each other for upwards of 20 years we met in seventh grade and never dated and then kind of reconnected later in life and we were both in Florida but we're long distance so we long distance dated and then we in person got engaged but we're long distance engaged and uh and then now we're long distance married so we're working on on getting into the same city which I think is kind of relevant to our story today so we have a a fur baby and life is good yeah thank you very much I appreciate you sharing that So where did real estate even pop into this, right? Here you are, you went to school for years, you have a great career. Why not just kind of stay there? Yeah, uh, great question. And it's it's kind of a long answer, but uh, you have to know the first part to understand the second part. And so I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I'm very grateful for all the lessons and support that my parents gave me. And I love them very much. But one of those lessons was not finance management. So <laughs> the extent of the financial literacy that I got was my dad saying, don't be in debt. That was it. And it was like, no blueprint, no plan, just that's it, just don't be in debt. And it was like, okay. <laughs> And then my first week of medical school, one of the physicians that was doing the orientation said, well, you're about to have four years of drinking water out of a fire hydrant. And sure enough, four years drinking water out of a fire hydrant and they fly by somehow and you're at graduation and then you're doing your exit interview for your student loans. And now I have, I'll be honest, $400,000 in student loan debt, right? So I'm looking at this as I'm graduating med school and I'm thinking of my dad's lesson of don't acquire debt. And I'm like, well, I failed that lesson. (laughs) So now what do I do? Right. And so in residency is still very, very busy, but wherever I could, I would pick up whatever bit of financial education I could, because I, at that point I was like, I got to figure this out. Luckily I didn't have consumer debt, which was great, but it was still a huge burden to handle. And, and so I came across, I don't know if you've heard of him, the White Coat Investor, which is, for those out there listening, he's a physician who's a practicing physician, but a big part of his life has been dedicated to educating physicians on finance management, because the truth is we don't get a lot of ed- education on finance management during our, our schooling. And so that's where I picked up some things. And as I started to kind of get the basics down, I kind of had this inkling of this real estate thing. It's, it's kind of interesting to me, but I didn't really know how to proceed. And so as I started accumulating my financial knowledge, then I started looking more and more into real estate because it just seemed something that attracted me. So here I am. And why why real estate? Because I know the white coat investor, right? And there are Mm -hmm. other places to put money. There are Mm -hmm. other strategies that are discussed, either with just throwing some money in stocks, with still thinking about more of retirement, Mm -hmm. whatever else it may be. Where did real estate pop up in that journey? So I think it's a great question, and you're absolutely right, and I I can't quote him exactly, but he said it in a couple of podcasts where even though he gives you education on real estate, he makes it clear that this is optional. You can absolutely live a whole life, build your finances, and never touch real estate, whether passive or active. But like I said, it was always something that kind of was attractive to me for some reason. And actually, somewhere between when I found you and when I was doing research and, and found you, and then actually in your questionnaire, is where it really hit me. And it was a really simple question when I was signing up for your mentorship program. It was a very simple question that just asked this, why real estate? Why do you want to do this? And that's where it clicked that I said, well, 
the reality is that I already am a real estate investor because I'm a home owner. So even if it's my primary home, I've already made that decision to allocate this money or take a loan out for this property that is now under my name. So even though it's not real estate investment, it, it is. It's not what we think about real estate investment, but any of us are making decisions of what to do with our money. And I, I know there are Instagram influencers who have millions of dollars and they have very strong opinions about never purchasing a home and you should rent. And then there are multi-million dollar influencers that say you should purchase a home, but you should pay off the mortgage and buy it cash. And then you have multi-million dollar influencers that would say you should purchase a home, you should put a little bit down and you should not ever pay off the mortgage. So whatever decision you make or whoever you follow or how you educate yourself, you have to make some sort of decision because we all need somewhere to live. And so how do you decide how to spend that money? And, and it's personal and it's mathematical, but that's when I realized when I was working on that question, I was like, ah, this is why, because I have to allocate money to this in some way, shape or form, even if it's renting. Right. So let me make the smartest decision possible. I also love what you said there about the idea that really every homeowner is actually an investor, right? Even if you just buy one home, you're that couple that's looking for your forever home and you're going to live there into your twilight years here. Those are still things that that property that you're buying is an investment, right? right? It could still be, yes, it's on the street you want and it has the garden space that you wanted for the Easter egg hunt or whatever that may be in your dreams here. But at the end of the day, hunkering down all that money is really an investment. So I really like thinking about that from really the perspective that every single time you buy a rental, buy a home, buy a property, it really is an investment. When you thought about some of the other options for investing, was there anything else that seemed like attractive to you? Or were you just kind of always like, nope, if I'm going to do this, real estate's the way to go? Oh, you mean outside of real estate? Oh, yeah. No, I, well, I, where I thought you were going was regarding, I purchased a primary home and I've rented it out and we'll talk, I'm sure, more about that, but versus short-term or short-term rentals, long-term rentals, passive versus active investing. And no, so I did, and I've said this to you, that to me, uh, real estate is my risky investment. And it's my risky investment because I didn't and don't know as much about it as some other people. I consider myself an expert physician. I'm an expert at being a physician, but I'm not an expert real estate investor. So the stocks and the bonds are more the conservative <laughs> investment for me, whereas the real estate is the a, a more aspirational or risky investment. So I wanted right. to go more conservative in that route. But but no, I kind of made up my mind. I told you that my, my husband and I are in two places and that it was kind of the catalyst to get things moving because I had to make a decision of what I was going to do with my home. So that's how that decision started to, to tumble and, and make the decision of what we're going to do with that money. Right. So you mentioned there also that influencer space, right? And you had mm-hmm. one strategy on one profile and another strategy on another profile. Do you remember how you came across Lady Landlords by chance? I was trying to think about it because I don't, but I will tell you there's a reason because I listen to a lot of podcasts along the way and, and I listen to non-investment podcasts as well, but something that I really liked about your podcast or what kept my interest was that you gave me a tidbit of information that I could apply or I could take away from with every podcast so that I could actually take actionable steps because even though I drive a lot, I don't like to listen something for 30 minutes, an hour, and then not walk away with anything. (laughs) So really what got me hooked to your podcast was that you actually gave me actionable items, even though it wasn't a personal podcast, but you gave me bits that I could actually apply or, huh, I really need to look this up. I want to learn more about this. So that's how I ended up following you. Good. That's, That's really cool to hear. You know, I do this and sometimes I don't necessarily always get that feedback back, but I really try to make it nice, short, direct, how to here's the information you need, kind of, okay, move on with your day. So I appreciate that. When then you were looking for some support moving forward and what to do kind of with that house, which we'll get into now, was that part of your decision of why our mentorship was then going to be a fit for you compared to other options? Yeah, absolutely. Because certainly because I, 
I had felt like what you were saying made sense. So even though it was educational to me and I didn't know anything about it, what you were saying, then I would look up or I would learn more about it and be like, oh, yeah, she actually knows what she's talking about. As opposed to somebody <laughs> not knowing what they're talking about, which there is a lot of, or people just mm-hmm. kind of make a lot of money with a $10 course or just whatever it might be. So, so yes, and I, I think when I started to take the steps, because we talk about analysis paralysis, and, and not to say that there certainly wasn't a, a component of that, but I wasn't so much in analysis paralysis. I had narrowed down what I wanted to do. I just didn't actually know how to execute it. How do you take the first step? I was ready to take it. I wasn't fearful of taking it, but I didn't know how to take that first step. And like I said, I just investigated different programs. And and again, when I came across yours, it, it clicked for me, just like with the questionnaire that you did, it, it clicked for me that this exactly was the missing link for me. And I relate it back to my medicine experience because all through medicine, through medical school and through residency, you read, you read, you read, you study, but it's not until you actually start to apply it that you start to learn. Until you see a patient that has these symptoms and you have to think about it critically, then it starts to mesh in your brain. But you learn from a textbook and then you have questions along the way and that's where you rely on your mentors and, and your attending physicians to ask them those questions. And when I found your program, I said, oh, well, I've had a mentor for everything else that I've learned in in life. Why would I think that I don't need one for real estate when in taking these steps? And as opposed to other programs that were more of a step-by-step, and you certainly provide that, but what what you provided more was an, an avenue or a resource to ask questions like, hey, I ran into this. Now what do I do? And that's what I realized I really needed to take that next step. Right. I'm glad you thought about that because we do. We usually have somebody, that teacher, that mentor, right? They were called different things when we were younger or in different arenas. But now all of a sudden in this space, it's like, oh, cool. I'm just going to go spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, let me just go into that blind. And it's like, maybe, Mm -hmm. maybe this is not the time to do that. Right. And then also, once again, it is kind of that guidance. Like I have 16 rentals. Every single one of them, there's been a different situation that's been unique to, right? It's not cookie cutter Mm -hmm where it's really just not as that simple of go out, find house, buy house, repeat. It's, oh my God, this came up in the inspection. This came up with the tenant. This came up with the seller. This came up with the loan. Mm -hmm. All those different things that you really have to work your way through as you go. And I think that's what what I really like about our community is that it is that platform to be able to talk through those things Mm -hmm. in real time and get help. So you already had then your primary residence Mm -hmm. when we started together. Right. And you kind of had an idea of where you wanted to go. Once again, it was more just the in between that you needed the support on. Can you just share with our listeners what your plan was coming in to working together? So I had purchased a new construction home in my city um, before my husband and I started dating. He had purchased a home in his city before he and I started dating. And so I had purchased this, this property trying to make a good financial decision knowing it might not be my forever home, but still trying to be smart about it. And when we started moving further in our relationship, he tried to get a transfer. We weren't successful with that. And so it came time that I had to make the decision that I was going to have to be the one to transfer. And at that point, it became clear that this primary home was not going to be my home anymore. And at some point, and so the decision is, well, do you sell or do you rent? And I didn't feel comfortable selling it because he already had a primary home. So it's not that we were going to purchase another one. So then what do you do with that money if you sell it? And secondly, I purchased the home at was a reasonable price then was a steal now. Not not that you would have known. Obviously, I'd much rather would have not gotten to the pandemic, but I got in at the price that I did then. The house has gained value. And then the interest rate that I got in was very, very low. It was less than 3%. So it made more sense for me to rent it and keep it longer term. The area was still growing. So that's how I made the decision of, I, I don't want to sell it. I definitely want to keep it and rent it and keep it for as long as I can. And so it doesn't make sense. And then I was very busy with work and I just kept saying, oh, I'm going to rent this home. People are like, what are you going to do with your house? I'm like, oh, I'm going to rent it. I'm going to rent it. But then I never took any steps to actually do anything. And my date to leave the city kept kind of getting pushed, but I started to realize that I was supposed to leave on that date, but I hadn't taken any steps to actually rent my home. So what was, <laughs> I was going to start renting it when I moved. 
So I actually made the decision to pull back from work. I was going to stay longer, but I was going to pull back so I could be at two places at once. And when I made that decision is when I got very serious about getting it rented because I, I realized if I can't do this when I've taken time off of work and, and pulled back, then I'm, this is just not a reasonable goal for me right now. So I need to make this happen with pulling back. <laughs> and if I can't, then forget it. And so that's when I got serious about looking for a mentorship or, or taking the next step. With that being said, then I kind of pivoted because the idea was just to rent this home and then move where my husband lives, and then that changed a little bit. Yeah. Let's talk, though, about turning your primary home into a rental property. What was your biggest concern? What was stopping you from going out and getting it rented? Just not having the time or the resources or the knowledge. In your podcast and your program, you talk a lot about building your team. And I really didn't even know I needed to do that. <laughs> you know, when I was talking about, oh, I need to get it rented, like, again, it's this magical idea of, oh, I'm going to get it rented, but I didn't really actually know the steps to do that. And then when I get home, I work a lot. So I would leave at seven, I'd get home at nine and I'd be like, okay, well, I guess I missed all the business hours for everything that I needed to get done. <laughs> so this cycle would kind of continue. And, and so that's where I made the decision, like, no, I'm moving. I need to make this a priority. I got to pull back some and really focus on it. Right. So that was actually one of my questions for you. You do have a very hectic schedule. You have a lot going on, very long days. Also, trying to still work with that long-distance relationship also has other mm -hmm. time that needs to be put into that relationship. What was one of the most useful things that you did to keep that balance of, okay, I have rental properties over here, dealing with stuff with my real estate, and yet still I'm making sure to keep a hold of my job? Yeah, I mean, it's still a work in progress, but trying to draw boundaries with, with the workplace as, as much as possible, which is hard because when there are patients at stake, there are just certain things you, you don't have the luxury of doing. Right. But I think for me, the first step was pulling back and just going, I'm still full-time, but I'm just not as full full-time so I can get home and go to the grocery store and do the things that I need to do. But I think that that's also what I evolved a little bit in my story is that when I started off, my intention was fully to be, it was, as I mentioned, it was a new construction home is a new construction or was, but the intent was for me to fully manage the property. And, and certainly that's what I loved about your program and um, have gleaned a lot of information from it. Um, and slowly that kind of evolved because I started to realize that it's, it's okay for me to have a property manager and yes. at this point in my life and my career. And it was part of also, I'm going to blow up your whole questionnaire, but you, you asked, well, how much do you want to make from real estate investing, right? So if you had, could name a number, and I, that question got me thinking as well, because I realized that I don't necessarily want to replace my physician income. I just want to complement it or have diverse income streams and, right. and have different options and be able to give myself a little bit more freedom at work to be able to dedicate the time to the patients that I want to um, and have that option. So I was really trying to find real estate to help to give me more freedom at work to have more work-life balance. Right. And I think in your situation, that made sense. You can mm -hmm. absolutely go and put the time and the effort and the energy into learning how to be your own property manager and how to self-manage right? And I do that even through other countries. Those are things that you could do, but that does not mean that it's a fit for everybody, all because that's what works for me at, in my life at this time doesn't mean that that's the same for everybody else. So I'm glad that we were able to kind of talk through that and say, hey, you know what? Right now, property manager is the way to go. And it sounds like in the way you're shaking your head here, it sounds like you still feel yeah. very confident <laughs> that that was the right, was the right decision, right? Right. Well, so I'm on call 24-7. I'm, I'm not a neurosurgeon, so my call is not nearly as hectic as some other <laughs> specialists. But my, my phone is on 24-7. And even though I, I don't often get a lot of calls overnight, it is still you put your head down at night and you have to realize that your phone is on and you could get a call at any time. Right. And, and then when I started thinking about self-managing, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I'm trying to get away from keeping my phone on. <laughs> and now right. moving towards keeping my phone on, even if they never call, even if those process is seamless and, and, and there are no issues, you still have to have your phone on. And so my husband asked me, it was the day I was on call, I was at the hospital and it just seemed like everything 
was going wrong. And I was going through this whole evolution of process of do I get the property, the full property management, or I was thinking I was going to do full self-management. And then I progressed to, well, I'm just going to get tenant placement services so that they place the tenant, they show the home, they take the pictures, et cetera. And then it evolved to, no, I'm just going to do full management. But during that process, I was weighing the pros and cons along the way. And I'm, I'm at the hospital and everything's going crazy. And my husband just asked me, I talked to him on the phone. He's like, so if you got a call right now about a leaky ceiling, right? <laughs> when you're in the midst of this, how would, how would that influence your decision? I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> right. Property management all the way it is. Sold. Right? Right. But I'm really happy that you thought that through. And also that's great that he helped you too. And like really kind of talked through what that was like and made the right decision for you. Right. I think that's great. And I think that's what's so cool about real estate investing is that we really can kind of match it for what's going on in our situation and what's really applicable. Mm -hmm. So then the other kind of curve in there, especially with that property management company, was that then you decided to buy another primary residence Mm -hmm. and stay actually in that same area for a little bit longer. Talk us through a little bit about that decision. Yeah, so like I mentioned, I was I was going to be leaving the city. I was going to be relocating to where my husband was, but the timeline kind of kept getting extended. And so the compromise was I was going to pull back on work so I could be more in the city that he's in, um, but I was going to be there longer. Um, so I was expecting to be there about a year still. And so I just kind of, again, started kind of this thought of, oh, if I'm going to be here for another year, I might as well purchase another property and rent this one out. And oh, ha, ha, wouldn't that be funny? And then, <laughs> wait a minute, <laughs> why don't I do that? I mean, it's an inconvenience to move, of course, but it's not that big of a deal. I, I grew up moving a lot. So it started as kind of this idea. And so it was, again, well, I'm going to move out of this primary home anyway. I'm going to rent it out anyway. The summer was coming up. And so it, it was a four-bedroom home. So it was a good time for to look at families for potential tenants. Right. And so I had a timeline in place. And because the other thing about it was that I didn't want to be in that home and moving at a time where it wasn't an opportune time for a family. I mean, not that anybody couldn't move in, but I would. I was thinking that the ideal tenant would probably be a family because it's a four-bedroom home. So I kind of set that timeline of I have to get this rented by the summer, and so let right. me move into downsize. And at that point, it became of purchasing a primary home with a primary mortgage with the intent to rent that long term. And so the stuff started. Right. And I love that idea because you really looked at that one year. And I love that we talk about that so much to have that owner-occupied property that we're, that we commit to really being there for that year, that it was just like bells going off being like, this is actually kind of a perfect opportunity to pick mm-hmm. up another rental. Yes, moving, setting everything up can be really annoying. That can absolutely suck. But to then be able to pick up another property with, once again, that owner-occupied financing, it's kind of a nice mm-hmm. advantage to it. And then you actually kind of threw something else into that that was also really helpful because you went back to the new build. So Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what it was like starting to search for that home that then led you back to purchasing a new build. So at that point, I was still thinking I was going to self-map all the properties. And so again, I needed something that was the lowest maintenance possible. I've had a good experience with my builder with my property, I mean, things here and there, but nothing crazy, you know, as the house settled and, and all that. So I knew that the house was going to be very low maintenance from a landlording standpoint. So I wanted, again, as I was thinking of self-landlording, I wanted something that was also low maintenance. And we asked the question of how did I handle that is that I tried to be very realistic with myself. How did I handle working full-time as a physician? And then also looking into these things. And I just tried to be very honest with myself about the actual time that I could dedicate to it. And so to me, the easiest, the low hanging fruit was a new construction home where the math made sense that was going to be low maintenance and things were still going to happen, but at least the search criteria or the potential for negotiation or whatever it might be, or finding things in the inspection was much, much lower than a home that was from 1950 or whatever it might be. And so that's how I ended up thinking more towards new construction. It was just to keep it simple. And it also helped with your financing. Mm-hmm. If I remember correctly, it also your interest rate through that new builder, especially once again, we were talking months ago now, interest rates were still still rather high. And that was a nice little perk 
that I felt like with mm-hmm. that new bill that also was just kind of the cherry on top, right? Right. No, absolutely. Because I have looked at different financing and you've helped me a lot with that, looking at different financing options um, as I was trying to narrow down what sort of property I was looking for. And so uh, with the builder, it, the interest rate that I got was, oh, gosh, I want to say it was at least 1% lower than yeah. it was the average mortgage rate, interest rate. So it was a no brainer. And then they could do so much more. I mean, there wasn't the negotiating back and forth, but they could do so much more from, oh, we'll throw in a fridge and a washer and dryer. We'll put in the blind. (laughs) It sounds like the price is right, but wait, there's more. (laughs) But no, it was, I do remember it was like a full point lower because at first when you were kind of talking about the new build, right. And we were then thinking total turnkey and all that, right. I was kind of sitting here being like, okay, she's me paying like top dollar for this because of that. And then looking at all those like little extra perks there. And also for you being busy and saying, I need something that really is going to be the least maintenance possible. It really just clicked as the opportunity. So Mm -hmm. you were able now, you have the full property manager for the primary residence now turn rental. You now move into brands, make a new home for yourself in that space. Mm -hmm. But I do remember a fun tenant issue that popped up yes. very, very early on. Would you share what happened? Well, there were a couple. Can you give me a hint? <laughs> with the tenants that moved in there, with their unusual request for you to change and how your neighbor became involved in it. Okay. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So the house is a new construction or was a 2020 build. And the neighborhood itself has never had great water pressure. It's been on our Facebook neighborhood group. Everybody's always complaining about it. Nobody's ever done anything about it. And so you just live with it. And then, of course, now I have tenants in the property and they get this water pressure. And it's, it's not great. I mean, it's, it's livable, but it's, it's not this. I'd even installed when I purchased the property or when I built the property, I put in a rain shower. And that was my treat to myself because I wanted to have these sauna spa feeling and then it was probably the biggest waste of money because it was just kind of this <laughs> I like mean, it's it, dripping it on you trickle, but yeah exactly and I'm like this isn't even worth it right so anyway I guess my my tenants weren't too happy with the water pressure and so they started talking to the neighbors and they so happened to talk to one of my neighbors and so instead of my neighbor telling them look this is an issue for the whole neighborhood she takes it upon herself to say, oh, it's because you don't have a water softener. You need to have her install a water softener. And I'm like, that's not, that's not what it's going to, what's going to fix right. it. But at that point, the tenants had their mindset that they wanted a water softener, that they're new to Florida, that they didn't know about hard water, that nobody had ever told them anything like that, and and so on and so forth. Now, it, let me back up a little bit and say that the property management that I found, the reason that I went with them and in building my team, like you had recommended, was that I had tried to find a few different realtors and I made them very clear of my plan that my plan was to, I wanted this property rented and I want to purchase a new property that I will, that will be an investment property that I will eventually rent, but it, I'm, it's going to be my primary. And so with the company that I went with, it was a one-stop shop where they had realtors right. to sell and purchase and sell. And then they also had property management. So with all that being said, I had told them at the beginning of this rental process, I said, listen, I've kicked around getting a water softener. I haven't committed to it just because I didn't get around to it. It doesn't bother me. But if you tell me that for future tenants, I need to put this in, I'll do it. I don't mind. It was not something I was against. And the owner of the company was like, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put money towards that. It's usually not an issue. And sure enough, Week one, <laughs> the new tenants. I'm spending two thousand bucks on a water softener, but like I said, it it was it. I haven't heard anything about the water pressure since, so who knows? Maybe it did fix the issue. Right, and once again, hopefully they'll be there longer term. That was kind of like mm-hmm. the one compromise, the one thing they were asking for, and that was a decision to be made of of moving forward with that. But did it wasn't it also the neighbor that gave the tenant your phone number? They did, yes. So, and I don't know which neighbor or I didn't, I was never home. So I, I love my, my immediate neighbors, but I didn't get to know the whole neighborhood. So I, I have a few right. that I suspect. And, and so the, the tenant, so I have this property manager, the tenant reaches out to me directly and it was a very nice text message. And it just said, we're so happy to be in your home. We want to keep it as clean as you did. Do you have a recommendation for any sort of maid services? 
just so we can continue that. And, and I, I was a little bit taken aback because I, again, these are things that until you experience them now, in retrospect, it, the answer is very obvious because I've heard it from you and I heard it from the property manager. But at the time, I was like, well, it's a nice text. They're not asking for the water, the water softener. They're not asking right. for a new fridge. They're just asking for continuing the services that right. I was using. I, I didn't happen to be using a maid at that time, but Anyway, I just wrote back just what I said, that uh, I think so much. I wasn't using the maid, um, but perhaps the property manager can can give you some recommendations, kind of to put it back to right. them. And they actually didn't even respond to that text message after that. And then I talked to you and I talked to the property manager and you were both like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I didn't know there was a so contract funny. in place. <laughs> right. Well, I just felt so bad. You went, you went through that whole decision process. You built your team. I loved, loved that you found that one-stop shop that can help get your current place rented and help you purchase the new place all through. And I know there was a little, little bump in the road there, but otherwise they mm -hmm. had great service. You've really had a good experience mm -hmm. with them overall. And then I just remember you being like, oh, so I just got this random message. I have to like, I didn't give them my phone number. don't know how they got my phone number along the way but it was just so funny like thinking about that being like you went through all the right steps to have somebody else manage it and then now here you're and once again it's not it wasn't a bothersome text it wasn't a complaint wasn't anything like that but now that's still time out of your day looking up right. made recommendations right. on google that you know to be able to like send to them it was it was just the, the irony of that yeah. like full circle right. and then i love that we then did have that teaching point of no hey you get to stay out of that Mm -hmm. Push it back to the property manager. Let's make sure that all moving forward, you don't then have that, the, them reaching out to you moving forward, that we really kind of nip that in the bud right now at the beginning and really get back to that intention of property managers there to make my life easier and to not have to have my time taken up with small questions, right? Let alone right. the big and question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that, well, it was a learning point on, on multiple levels, because I think what you were alluding to that I left out is that um, I I just assumed when they texted me directly that the property manager had given me, that at some point in the paperwork, it was there, and they looked it up, and they texted me. But when I talked to the property manager, they said, absolutely not. This is right. not something that we disclosed. This is not something that we gave them. And that's when I assumed that one of my neighbors, get, I, I, I never got around to actually confronting anybody, but I just assumed how would they have received my number otherwise because she also the property manager said this is also in place we're here to protect you right. as a landlord and so if they're having interactions with you that not only puts you at risk it puts us at risk and so it it, it became a it what luckily it wasn't anything but it it brought to light to me something that I didn't I was just like oh it's a benign little text just asking for some recommendations but it, it could have been something a little bit more more it, it you know risky than I even thought of Correct. There could have been a different situation. It could have been a different question, a different issue. Same thing. I think the conversation would have went differently if they sent you a message saying, hey, we don't really like the water pressure. We need a, <laughs> right. We need you to fix that. And you responded to that. Who knows where that kind of would have went. So happy it was a very benign question. But once again, better to even kind of just get that relationship solid from the beginning. So no, I think that was great. Right. You got to move into a new place. And really, that's just kind of a holding pattern until turning that into a rental as well. So Correct. I like it because it really just shows that there's a lot of different ways to still make this business work for really kind of anyone. Mm -hmm. So share with us what's next for you. Yeah, so what's next? So I am going to be moving to the same city as my husband. <laughs> so what's next for us is right now we're in a saving pattern. We're just trying to put as much money away. I think I, you've seen our journey along the way where I, I started off as very much like, I'm going to be doing this. He's a very supportive role. He's a very supportive husband, but this is my show. And right. his interest has been a little peak during my journey. Whereas, he, like I said, he's always been supportive. But as I started to do a little more, he's like, yeah, maybe we should do this. And I'm like, mm -hmm. so now, now we're doing more things together and investigating some options. But right, our, our current goal right now is to save up as much money as possible for the down payment for our next property. And so what we're looking at is to purchase one more property purely as an investment property here to rent out as a long-term rental. And then, like I said, he owns his home in his city. And so our goal there would be to then purchase another primary and rent out his home there eventually. That, that's our right. next step. But what I love within that 
is really you would have your original home plus the new one that you just bought, his mm -hmm. one that you would have, a new rental property, and then that one more rental property you're talking about getting now, and then a new primary with the two of you, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking five houses there, right? In total, right. one that you'd be living in. We are not talking about having 50 doors. We are not talking about having to buy 19 different places in the same year. We're talking mm -hmm. very right. conservative growth, consistently taking action, adding mm -hmm. on to that and making smart moves along the way. It doesn't always have to be, oh my God, I'm a failure because I didn't buy a property this month. I love when you said mm -hmm. to me a couple months ago, hey, right now we want to get back to savings mode. That's part of our plan. That's our goals. And you're completely right. That was the best decision for you guys to make. And I loved that. I love that it wasn't this competition. Oh my God, I saw on Instagram, this person closed on another property mm -hmm. or, oh, somebody in Lady Landlords has eight properties, Becky. So now I can't stop at seven. No, this is what yeah. fits for you and for your family, right. for your home. And I think that was really cool to see you do that. I also love seeing your husband all of a sudden start to kind of take a little interest. Our calls were always just the two of us, right? And I get that mm -hmm. you're in different <laughs> cities. But I remember the one call where you were like, look who's with us. And I was like, yeah. who? <laughs> and then it was interesting to see him really take an interest. He answered questions. I gave him a little bit of homework to kind of start working on it. So yeah. I love the fact that now, because that happens, our partners are not always on board with the same thing. Trust me, it's the same way in my house. And there's a ton of stuff mm -hmm. that my husband wants to do that I have absolutely no interest in as well. And it worked kind mm -hmm. of both ways, but I love seeing that you still decided one to move forward and still go with it. And he was supportive of that. But now all of a sudden he's kind of looking over your shoulder being like, Hey, what are you doing? What are you doing over there? Mm -hmm. I kind of want a piece of this mm -hmm. now. And I think that's really kind of cool. Yeah. And I really look forward to hopefully kind of in that next purchase to hopefully seeing him a little bit more on those calls and taking an active role about how you guys now are going to kind of blend your vision, his vision kind of together even more than your, than your plans already have laid out. Right. And I think you touched on a few great things there, which is how did I balance both? How did I balance being a physician and, and not having time? And it was it, because, again, you can do short term rentals, you can do long term rentals, you can do flips. So even just coming to the conclusion of, what, OK, what can I do right now? And that quote that says preparation meets opportunity. And so it was, OK, well, what do I have in front of me now? And what do the next few months, years look like? And what I have in front of me now is a home that I know I'm not going to sell. So the right. low hanging fruit is I'm going to keep it, rent it out, and then move to the next step. And so we've just tried to make the smartest decisions possible with what we have. Could we have made quicker money by doing a flip and renovating? Maybe, but I don't know anything about that. So probably not. I probably would have lost money. You, know? you would not have made more money on that because you would have never gotten through it. You would have hated it. It would have stressed you out. <laughs> you would have had to kind of walk away in the middle of it. You might have had to then sell for and take it a loss on it. Who knows? But you wouldn't, you wouldn't have made more money on it because you would have never completed it. It would have not been right for you. And I love that you stayed true. And that's really why I wanted you so bad to come on the podcast and to share this interview was because I feel like so many women in Lady Lemons feel that pressure that they always have to do what the other person is doing or follow somebody mm -hmm. else's strategy or be like, well, that's how they made money. So I have to do the same. And that's not the case. We really need to think about what is right for you specifically. And you really held to your guns here. And I think that's why you're doing well in this. And that's also why you like it and you're happy and you don't feel stressed mm -hmm. out about it. And you can, you understand the plan moving forward. So I think that was so smart of you to have the clarity and the confidence to stick with really what was really best for you specifically. Yeah, well, I'll yeah. tell you one more thing uh, where it's just because of the irony of it and, and all is good. But when you get to this point now, I've forgotten about putting the house up for rent and moving. All that is behind me. It doesn't exist, right? And so the, the worst is over. Now I'm living in my new construction home that I'm eventually going to rent and move out of. And uh, the check for from the property management for, my, for the rent for the month hits the bank account, right? Because there's a little bit of a delay uh, while they process it. And for the first time, I thought, oh, this is the easiest money I've ever yeah. made. <laughs> and I was like, you kept, you've forgotten about every, all the work you did, right? Oh, this is the easiest money I ever made. And that day, my new construction feeling started leaking. And I was like, oh, there's always something. 
Not a big deal. It's getting corrected. I mean, it's still under warranty, so I just called them up and they're going to address it. But I, I just thought it was so funny. And it was leading up to this this podcast. So I was like, gosh, that's why I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Right. And that also goes to remind you that this is not like mailbox money, right? Yeah. There still are things that we have to do. There's still situations that are going to pop up, but with systems and the right plan, you can really minimize so many of those things. So I think that's the moral of your story. So Cassandra, yeah. thank you so much for spending the time with us. See, thanks to property management, you even have the time to be here, right? But I know, I do. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming on, spending your time just sharing your story with our members. So I really appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Of course. To all of our other listeners out there, please do make sure to hit that subscribe button so you do not miss the next episode of the Lady Landlords podcast. We release new episodes every single Tuesday. And if you enjoyed today's episode, and I know you did, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Reviews are what helps other women be able to find our community and make sure that they realize that they are not alone and can also get the support that they need in growing their real estate portfolios. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I'll see you next Tuesday for the next episode of the Lady Landlords Podcast. Thank you for listening to the Lady Landlords Podcast. If you're feeling stuck in your real estate investing journey, Visit lady-landlord.com to book a 15-minute orientation call with me and see if you're ready to join our mentorship program. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter and join our Facebook group for exclusive real estate investing tips and offers. Invest with confidence. Become a Lady Landlord today.